Well, hello there, folks. This is Sanchez with our first flipped video lecture. Welcome to the 21st century, folks. Today in class, we're going to go through our first flip lecture together, give you the basics of how to set it up in your history logbook. And hopefully by the end of today's lecture, you'll have a better understanding of our timeline of democracy. All right, first things first, I want to go ahead and make sure that everybody has their history logbook open to a nice clean sheet of paper. And today I think we're going to practice a strategy which many of you used before, something called Cornell note, Cornell note taking. Now, my myself, I've used Cornell notes all through college. It's a great strategy. It's a way to organize your notes and also be able to use your notes to go back and review. So you can see on the front screen right now I have a setup. A uh, typical Cornell note format is going to be create a left-hand column, and that left-hand column you're going to leave empty for now. That's where you're going to write keywords, questions, annotations, and then the bulk of our note-taking will be on the right-hand side. So this is where you're going to put today's discussion, video notes, important dates, um, that important information goes on the right-hand side. Please note at the bottom you can see there's also a portion for the summary. It's a really great strategy, folks, to go back through your notes after the lecture and maybe even perhaps listen to this lecture again one more time to uh, finish up with a summary to make sure you understand the key concepts. All right, the first couple slides I want to go back a step and just review. We started the class with a discussion of the history of democracy going all the way back to ancient Greece right around 508 BC. And we know direct democracy starts in Greece, and our definition of direct democracy is every citizen voted directly. Now, reminder, when we say citizen, we're primarily talking about male, we're talking about wealthy, landowners, no slaves, no females were involved in the democratic voting process. Uh, with direct democracy, again, we had the benefit of getting a multitude of voices. We didn't just have one ruler or one king. And also with the Greeks, we have uh, reviewed or talked about the discussion of Greek philosophy. So Greek thinkers were the type of guys that would want to ask questions. They're asking questions using logic and reason. So in class, we talked about names like Aristotle, um, like Plato, for example, which asked questions, who should be given the power to rule? The people that are wise, the philosopher kings. Um, and then we also mentioned Socrates. So, in addition to direct democracy, the Greeks give a lot of background information to kind of understand how democracy starts and begins. All right, the second group that we mentioned in class, going back to the Romans with the Roman Republic. Now, remember, the Romans kind of pick up where the Greeks leave off, and they also develop a system of democracy, but it's slightly different. The Roman Republic is going to use something we, we call the representative form of democracy. Now this is a little bit different than actually giving every citizen the individual voice. This is where citizens are going to elect leaders that will go actually cast their vote or represent what the voter wants. So for example, if we think about the United States of America, President Obama doesn't ask every single person in America to directly vote on a law or something that he wants to change within the country. President Obama will work with a group known as Congress, which happens to be the representative body. We as voters, we elect those leaders, and they work with our government to make smart choices and hopefully make our country a safer and better place. Now, fast forwarding a little bit, folks, because we did kind of begin our discussion with Greek and Roman democracy. Um, we are going to kind of fast forward, but I wanted to briefly share with you uh, kind of where you picked up in 7th grade world history, which after the Greeks and Romans, we see most of Europe goes, is going to fall into a system of feudalism. And medieval feudalism begins roughly around 400 to the year 1200. And it's a system, and you can see right there in the front, I put that triangle that may look familiar. It's a system in which that we see there's a structure of loyalty. So you can see at the very bottom of the pyramid have your, your peasants or the farmers. Um, they're the ones that are going to owe land, they're going to owe rent, they're going to own crops to the higher tier, which are the lords. Now the lords are going to, of course, control the peasants, but the lords are going to owe their loyalty to the king 
and ultimately the king has the most power in a feudal society. Now that being said, the king still had an obligation to work with the lords and protect the lords, but bottom line in this particular structure in feudalism, we didn't have a fair voice for the citizen. For the most part, it was kind of that top-down approach where the king and the lords made the decisions and had most of the power. Now the kings had a lot of power and the kings can make of course decisions in terms of how they use the money and what decisions they made for their country. So fast forward a bit to right around the 1200s, um, England at the time had a king named King John. Now King John of England wasn't necessarily the best leader in the sense he was choosing to put England in a situation where it was fighting a lot of costly wars with different European countries. For example, France. Now, you can only guess, folks, that to go fight a war, that's going to take a lot of money. Think about you have to pay the soldiers, you have to buy the supplies, you have to make sure they have ammunition and weapons. Um, so, of course, the question is, where does the king get the money to fight these very expensive wars? Bottom line, it comes from the people. And King John started raising a series of taxes to try to raise money for his wars. Now, you can obviously guess a lot of the people, especially those lords that have land and money and title, were getting a little concerned that they weren't necessarily getting a voice in the decisions for England. So we see by 1215, these lords really have enough. And they go to King John and they say, you know what, you need to start working with us. You need to start understanding that you are king, of course, and we're loyal to you. But at the same time, you have an obligation and you have a job to do for us. And what you can see in this picture, folks, is you can see sort of reluctantly, um, King John is signing a document which is going to go down in world history as one of the greatest documents in history um, known as the Magna Carta. Now, the Magna Carta is for the first time up to this point, we actually have a document, a contract, that is going to put restrictions uh, limiting the power of the king and putting it back in the hands of the people. With the Great Charter, or the Magna Carta, now the king must consult uh, the lords and the different nobles before he's going to make decisions for England. So it sounds pretty simple, folks, but this is a sort of game changer when it comes to having people's voices heard and working with their government, which of course at the time was King John. All right, so to understand the Magna Carta a little better, I pulled a video clip for us to take a look at. So in your notes right now beneath Magna Carta, I would definitely write the words to signal to your note taking that this is a video clip. Um, so the video clip is called 800 Years. Just recently, uh, last year, uh, Magna Carta celebrated its 800th birthday. Um, so pretty significant, folks. There was a lot of celebrations across the country and in Europe and, of course, England. Um, so the video clip is about three minutes. Remember, we've talked about our expectations during a video clip, so I'll be checking as you are listening carefully. But as you're watching the video clip, of course, I want you to jot down a few notes that is going to help enhance your understanding of what this document was and, of course, why was it so important to our discussion of democracy? Here we go. This is the story of an 800-year-old medieval document known as Magna Carta, or the Great Charter. It's one of the most famous documents in the world. But how did this old, old piece of parchment become such a powerful symbol of our rights and freedoms? Magna Carta was granted in 1215 and established for the first time that everyone, even the king, had to obey the law. When Magna Carta was printed for the first time, it became the first law that all English lawyers studied. But many people didn't realize its significance. Shakespeare wrote a play about King John in which he failed to mention Magna Carta. In the 1600s, English lawyers used Magna Carta to challenge King Charles I. At this time, the king could ignore Parliament and imprison anyone who opposed him. 
inspired by Magna Carta, Sir Edward Cook wrote the Petition of Right, which set out to limit the king's powers. Around the same time, Magna Carta was taken overseas to America by the first British settlers. Many American colonies based their own laws on Magna Carta. Then, in the 1770s, the Americans fought for independence from Britain. Magna Carta became a symbol of American liberty, and its principles were echoed in the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. In 18th century Britain, Magna Carta was used to protest against the censorship of the press. At this time, people could be imprisoned without trial for criticizing the king. When newspaper publisher John Wilkes was arrested for insulting King George III, he used Magna Carta to fight for his freedom. He claimed that ancient English liberties were under threat. Wilkes's campaign showed Magna Carta on everything from posters to teapots. You could say that Magna Carta went far. In the 1800s, very few people had the right to vote in Britain. A nationwide movement of working people known as the Chartists inspired by Magna Carta, created a people's charter to fight for all men to have the vote. Then, in the early 1900s, the suffragettes used Magna Carta to argue that all women should have the right to vote too. Increasingly, people across the empire argued for rights equal to those of British citizens. Gandhi fought successfully for greater freedom of Indian settlers in South Africa. He described the resulting document as the Magna Carta of our liberty in this land. In his famous speech from the dock, Nelson Mandela declared his admiration for Magna Carta and for Western democracy, which he contrasted with the oppressive South African regime. Perhaps the most significant influence of Magna Carta today is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Written after the atrocities of World War II, the declaration states that people around the world are protected by fundamental human rights, regardless of their citizenship, race, gender, or beliefs. Eleanor Roosevelt famously said that the declaration may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. Although very few of Magna Carta's original clauses remain valid in English law, it continues to inspire people worldwide. All right, we're going to go ahead and hit the pause button. So at this time in the first half of the lecture, we've gone over direct democracy in Greece, the Roman Republic, feudalism in Europe, and introduced Magna Carta in 1215. So take a moment, we're going to have a discussion with your table mates and see the notes that you have taken so far. All right, so the last piece of the lecture today I want to introduce, um, in addition to Magna Carta, and in the video clip it did a nice job also connecting to the fact that Magna Carta has tremendous influence not just on democracy in England, but of course when we continue our discussion with democracies of the United States of America, our Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Bill of Rights. Um, but also, the Magna Carta later on will have a tremendous influence on a later document for the English people known as the English Bill of Rights. Now, on the screen it says the Glorious Revolution. In England, it got to the point where the people, the nobles, felt that the king still was not working with the people, not listening to their concerns, and not truly honoring the Magna Carta. So in this case, they actually fought a revolution the reason why we call it the Glorious Revolution is also known as the Bloodless Revolution, meaning it was a pretty smooth transition of power. And now with the Glorious Revolution, the representative body, which in England it's called Parliament, actually got to decide who the King and Queen of England should be. In this case, those handsome folks on the front screen will be William and Mary. Now, what the Glorious Revolution does, it says it establishes something called a constitutional monarchy. Now, a constitutional monarchy is where the king, we've already talked about what a monarchy means, is going to have to work with the people to develop rules and laws for the country. 